I think uh, we're okay to go ahead and get started. Everybody's uh, agreeable. Yeah. yeah. So uh, let me just begin by officially welcoming everyone and thanking you all for coming out to join us. Uh, you know, it's a it's an opportunity for uh, the HIA to to really hear directly from our members about their concerns regarding uh, this development from the DEA and the interim final rule. The uh, real or uh, potential impacts on your businesses and your your lives, uh, and and to uh, you know use that knowledge in a way that that helps advance the uh, the efforts that we're making on the legal front. So um, before I go farther on the legal front, I do have to uh, uh, sort of cite a little disclaimer from our attorneys. As you uh, are no doubt aware, the HIA is a plaintiff on uh, not one but two suits. Uh, regarding this uh, DEA interim final rule, one in uh, civil court and one in uh, a, a court, circuit court of appeals. Um, and we can get into that a little bit, uh, but uh, because the, the, legis or the litigation is pending and it's very sensitive, our legal, time, legal team has advised us to avoid commenting in depth on the subject uh, about the, the, the particular strategy or, or getting too um, um, uh, waxing to, to too too uh, um, too much on 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 issues related to uh, the the strategy of the case. So uh, because it's very important litigation, we want to be sure to follow their guidance, and we're just going to be uh, being somewhat reserved with respect to specifics about the case. But that that being said, we can certainly talk about the strategy itself, um, likelihood of success, uh, and and I'm going to start off. If everybody is agreeable, I wanted to just kind of give a kind of a background. To put this situation in context historically, so um, um, you know this is uh, hardly the first time that the hemp industry has faced a uh, challenge from the uh, DEA in terms of uh, trying to um, um, make aggressive actions that, that can bring harm. So uh, I, I think with that in mind, it is a um, uh, it, it makes sense to sort of kind of go over that history a little bit. <clears throat> um, I'm just going to share my screen here because. Uh, what I did, I'm a, I'm a big believer in never reinventing the wheel when it's already been well, well, uh, well invented. And not too long ago, the um, Hemp uh, Roundtable put together a little um, um, uh, series of slides on uh, on this fact. So we're gonna, um, I'm gonna just uh, crib off their notes here a little bit and um, start this from the beginning. So. Uh, you know, the, the antagonism from the DEA goes back all the way to 1979 when they started something called Operation Hemp, which, uh, you know, was to eliminate marijuana planting altogether, but it was indiscriminate and it, and it had no, uh, uh, you know, no controls to keep them from uh, um, going after hemp. And, and uh, it was, a, you know, for the time, a pretty uh, small effort, but $3.3 million for 45 states. They're doing helicopter pro pro uh, patrols and uh, even set up a toll-free hotline so they could crack down hemp growing. Um, in 1999, there was a big case where uh, the DEA seized a, a whole truckload of 20 tons of sterilized hemp seed, uh, a bird seed that was uh, on its way to a bird feed factory in Michigan. And there was a big court battle and they eventually ended up uh, releasing it. Uh, then in 2000, they went after um, uh, the Lakota uh, Nation in Sioux Falls um, armed DEA and FBI agents showed up and just burned the crops of, of uh, native uh, populations that were growing hemp uh, um, on uh, Alex Whiteplume's uh, farm. Um, in tw uh, 2001 and uh, uh, 2002, um, they twice tried to ban hemp foods, uh, hemp oil uh, seed um, in particular, um, and it was the HIA and uh, its allies that uh, challenged that move in federal court and ended up getting uh, in 2004 after uh, uh, um, uh, some time uh, getting securing a judgment that um, clearly established that the that uh, hemp oil seed was not subject to the DEA's. Well uh, it's oh, the sorry. day is I'm 48 minutes late. Okay. Well, how, how long is the webinar? Um, so uh, that was a that was a pretty big thing because you know they in addition to attempting to schedule hemp oil seed as a as a, um, a schedule one narcotic they also uh, banned the import of, uh, of hemp oil from outside of the United States which would have really completely killed the natural foods industry uh, hemp foods industry and uh, uh, it was a pretty seminal victory that clearly set uh, uh, hemp oil outside of their area of jurisdiction. 
Um, um, in 2014, they stopped another hemp shipment, um, uh, which you know was an inappropriate, uh, uh, um, aggressive action against the state of Kentucky and, and uh, laws that they had uh, allowing shipments. Um, they stopped a 250-pound shipment of hemp seed in Louisville, and the state itself sued them, and they ended up backing down. And then as recently as 2017, uh, the, we had to take the DEA back to court and uh, try to uh, hold them in contempt because they weren't abiding by that 2004 judgment. And uh, what that did was it forced the DEA to come to the table and forced a dialogue where they ended up with a negotiated settlement that was in favor of the hemp industry. So, um, you know, when we talk about this, it's, I think it's, uh, it's important to remember that, uh, you know, uh, this isn't our first rodeo as an industry. And uh, from a institutional standpoint, HIA has a history and a background in not only taking the DEA to court, but winning important victories in federal court in order to defend the rights of the hemp industry. So um, with that said, Rick, uh, you want to start us off? Yeah, I just want to go into kind of some of the some of the uh, issues we're having. Obviously, with uh, the lawsuit, we need to show that there are damages and, and there's been irreparable harm caused to our members, right, of the association. And we have over 300 um, processing members who process cannabinoids specifically. Uh, and as you know, anytime, according to the IFR, if that uh, level of cannabinoids in that extract or THC specifically goes over 0 0.3, there's potential criminal liability, right? So that's caused some of the equipment ma makers to shut down. It's not making processing equipment. It's caused some people not move forward with uh, business plans. It's caused investment not to come through uh, for new businesses. Uh, the growth we were seeing in the industry uh, last year is, has been significantly uh, dampened because of the interference and the, and the, um, the fear of enforcement of the IFR from the DEA. Um, you know, retailers are down or obviously on top of COVID. There's a lot of uh, direct impact that this is having. Law enforcement, we saw this in, in before the 2017 decision, law enforcement, local law enforcement, counties and, and, and local police um, sometimes can feel more emboldened to raid uh, shops. This happened in Tennessee and happened in, uh, in Kentucky as well. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of direct uh, impact we see of our members because of this IFR. And, and we don't think that sending a letter to the DEA or sending a letter to the president or sending a letter asking to play nice but really doesn't seem to have the impact and uh, doesn't seem to get us where we need to be. And the only way we've gotten where we need to be as an industry is to take action against the DEA. Um, and so that's, uh, that's where we're at. And we think this is a, this is a good way to, again, stabilize the industry, get clarity on extracts and, and really stop uh, the interference and allow uh, this hemp industry to continue to thrive like it has over the last three or four years. Great, thanks very much. Rob, you wanna share a little bit about uh, the IFR from your, uh, your perspective? Yeah, abs absolutely, thank you. So I'll just get a little brief background just uh, on some of my background on the DEA and working with the DEA. Um, you know, I run a pharmaceutical company uh, that is a licensed uh, DEA Schedule One licensed facility. So I definitely know, you know, a lot about working with the DEA directly. Uh, you know, we have the ability to work with uh, the different cannabinoid molecules, uh, THC, synthetic, uh, plant-based. Uh, so, you know, I was surprised just at the recent events with the IFR, uh, especially since, you know, the DEA, uh, you know, what, uh, the, last, uh, the last round, uh, you know, they took it off the schedule, uh, CBD really, uh, from hemp. Uh, really, that was the official move they were supposed to make. And uh, they didn't because they just backdoored this IFR. Uh, based on processing, uh, so we were very we were very um, surprised by that. But you know, really, the reality is, if you look at what a Schedule One drug is, uh, you know, it basically uh, says it has no medicinal benefit, as you guys know. It also says that it can be highly addictive, uh, and uh, there's no real use for it in the in the medical community under the supervision of a doctor. There's no benefit. So those are the three things. No, no true medical benefit has been shown scientifically, uh, you know, and uh, it, it, you can't be, it can't be, it's very addictive and it can't be really utilized under a doctor's, uh, you know, uh, I guess, uh, you know, supervision. Uh, so we, we know one drug that uh, is actually sold every day um, that has that characteristics is nicotine, right? If you think about it. <laughs> so it's really, really surprising that they're putting, you know, even THC and CBD 
uh, in a schedule one drug category. Just, I just like to put that out there because it doesn't fit the definition whatsoever. You have a CBD prescription drug that's been proved to be medically, uh, you know, uh, beneficial. You have uh, two synthetic THC drugs that are out in the market that are uh, proven to be medically, uh, you know, beneficial. So it's just such a, it's a surprise that they're still doing this uh, little dance, so to speak. Uh, and this dance obviously has, uh, you know, a, a huge trickle down effect in the economy, uh, you know, to especially, uh, you know, in uh, states that are really uh, started that critical mass movement in uh, hemp, uh, not only, uh, you know, growing in agriculture, but, uh, you know, extractions, processing products. I mean, people spending all their investment dollars and, in, uh, you know, working, you know, putting all the effort in uh, to developing good products using hemp. Uh, or, or like you said, I think they're pulling back or they're just afraid to uh, move forward and uh, potentially have a huge economic uh, loss uh, because of that. So that being said, um, you know, I think uh, the best approach anytime uh, you do have a, a disagreement on the law. I think the, you know, the U.S. was, uh, the Constitution was developed this way. I think the best approach is to challenge that law and to challenge that law in the courts because just by being, you know, uh, this squeaky wheel doesn't always get the law changed. Uh, you have to really directly go and challenge the law. That's been done in a multitude of industries. But, uh, you know, I think uh, from our perspective, uh, from a scientific perspective, it makes no sense. Um, and, uh, you know, we think that it's the right move, even being a pharma company, having the Schedule One license. Uh, I think the only way to move the needle with the DEA, any FDA, in times is to challenge them. So that's kind of my take, but I'd be happy to answer some questions on that later. Great, thanks Rob. Yeah. And uh, Todd, you wanna share a little bit from your perspective if you would. The DEA's new rule could put us out of business overnight. Just think about that. That is a quote from Janelle Ralph. She's the founder of Palmetto Harmony. It's uh, one of the leading uh, hemp CBD brands out there on the market. Uh, it's uh, USDA organic. Uh, they support regenerative agriculture. In 2019, they merged with RE Botanicals run by John Rulak. RE stands for regenerative agriculture. They donate 1% of profits to um, educating about regenerative agriculture purposes, which is really, I, I saw Kiss the Earth last night on Netflix and uh, Rec that's a nice recommendation for anyone to watch that. Uh, really, hemp is uh, is really um, positioning itself to to lead, be a, a lead crop in the regenerative agriculture uh, revolution. Um, it has the promise of being uh, the new commodity crop uh, for American farmers to go with, uh, you know, cotton and corn and wheat that th th those are up around 90 million acres a year and not wheat, but, uh, you know, soybeans, uh, corn, those are all genetically modified, you know, 90 plus percent of, of all the soybeans and all the corn is gen genetically modified. Hemp has the promise of being a new commodity crop to come out of the gates as organic. Um, that's huge. And to the natural products industry, uh, which I'm a part of, um, this is, we love that and we, we support that and we support brands that go USD organic. So it's always the people and it's the legislators that always try to put these regulatory bodies back in their place. You know, as they say, a regulator's gonna regulate. That's what they do. You know, it's like you put, get a, you know, uh, give a, you know, a carpenter a problem and he's gonna come at it with a hammer and nail. And so regulators are gonna regulate. And so it's up to, it's up to, people, it's up to legislators, it's up to us here at the Hemp Industries Association to put them back in the box. And so the regulatory uncertainty today by the DEA and really also the USDA, and yesterday and tomorrow by the FDA, um, it can really make or break the market. Um, and so it's, it's, it's up to us at the, at the HIA to prevent regulatory overreach and bring the full promise of hemp to consumers and make no mistake, the consumers want it. And, uh, you know, so that's it from my perspective. Thanks very much, Todd. And uh, very fascinating to hear about it from the natural product side. I think, you know, everybody here is probably uh, already, uh, a, you know, their own version of a hemp evangelist. My own perspective is, uh, you know, being with the HIA just for a couple of months is 
the, everything that I've learned has turned me into one. So, so it's always reassuring to hear that uh, other people share my perspective on the promise of, of hemp and, and uh, all that it, all the, all the excitement that it is in, I hear from members that's uh, you know, reflected in a lot of what you say. So that's great. Um, you know, just on that one point before we, we jump into to the audience, I think the, um, the HIA, uh, incur, uh, you know, we would encourage each of you, if you haven't already, to take advantage of your opportunity uh, to register a public comment on this rule. Um, while the DEA made their rule uh, effective immediately and, and therefore the public comment function that's available through the, uh, the Federal Register is, is uh, you know, uh, not informing the, the rulemaking the way the public comments uh, um, process is supposed to, the greater the, uh, the volume of comments that they get in, against that, this action, those things do have, uh, you know, not just, a, uh, not just an incidental impact. I mean, there's a PR element to it, um, but there's also just, you know, the very fundamental right of Americans to express their opinions about what their government is doing. And I would just encourage you, if you haven't already, to, um, uh, to check that out. It's, uh, it's available. You can Google, uh, you know, public comment on the DEA's IFR. If you like, I'll be happy to send around a link after this. The date, uh, the deadline is uh, four days away. It's the 20th. So we still have some time to get, uh, uh, get your comment in before that deadline. And the, the more pushback they get, the better. And uh, just to give you an idea of what the HIA said, I was going to um, uh, ju just read the last paragraph of ours because we basically did a pretty short and sweet public comment that said that the you know they're trying to uh, that hemp is an agricultural commodity and the DEA has no business trying to regulate it at all and um, you know this is in direct con contravention to the 2018 Farm Bill and this is what isn't what Congress intended but we finished with this point which I think is really salient for for the Drug Enforcement Administration. The DEA's interim final rule issued two years after enactment of the law it purports to interpret attempts to schedule an agricultural product, the consumption of which has never resulted in a single recorded death by overdose. By comparison, in 2018, which was the most recent year for which national data is available, America was losing 128 people per day to opioid overdoses. So if that trend is held steady, more than 75,000 of our friends, family, colleagues, and neighbors have overdosed by opioids since the passage of the 2018 Farm Bill, and we respectfully suggest that the DEA could more effectively serve the American public if it would cease engaging in efforts to regulate hemp products and instead refocus its limited resources of time and tax dollars on the ongoing and severe issues that do reside clearly within its scope of responsibility. So I, I, I shared that with you because even though we can't get into the meat of the case. That spirit is really behind the action. The idea that the DEA has no business in hemp anymore. The 2018 Farm Bill really established that. And every attempt to muddy the waters is a drag on this industry that is already facing significant headwinds. And there's so much potential for uh, you know, the development of hemp as an agricultural commodity, the adoption of new products, but there's so much needs for infrastructure and research. Every bad association created by overreach like this is really an impediment to us reaching our potential as an industry. And we think it is the proper role of the trade association at the national level to defend that hard won ground jealously. The, you know, a lot of thousands of activists and our members and patients and individuals who care about this issue fought hard to make sure that hemp was legal. And we don't want to let the DEA get an inch back into throwing any of that into question. So with that uh, sort of uh, uh, principle in mind, I would love to um, uh, open the floor to our guests and ask you uh, to please share with us your perspective on this IFR, you know, how you've seen this impact your business, if at all, or what your fears are that it may, um, you know, where your concerns are coming from, from an operational standpoint, and what the real practical impact is on, on you uh, as, as industry, hemp industry professionals. I want to thank you all very much for being here. I know I'm speaking for our board members as well to say that we really welcome your dialogue, your input, and I hope that you will all um, seek out opportunities to share your opinions with us um, directly by email and by uh, uh, you know, letting us know as business progresses if you see uh, real implications uh, happening as a result of this IFR, or you have other questions or concerns, or you just want to talk through uh, your questions about the industry issues that is what we're here for and we want uh, to, to do what we can to help you succeed. Thanks so much and uh, have a great day.